Hi, everybody. So, Tara made a wonderful introduction, and I'm going to be talking to you about climate change and why I think you should think that climate change is the most important challenge we're facing on currently. So, okay. So, the Earth has been measured, the Earth's temperature has been measured about 25 times. And um, anyone who's older than 30 here in this audience will have experienced those measurements taking place. And anyone who is in their 20s or mid-20s might have experienced some of these taking place in their lifetime. My point is that this generation and this group of people have been living in the warmest planet that has ever been recorded. Now, the problems of global warming are not just the obvious problems that all of you are thinking about, like ice caps are melting, sea level rise, loss of habitat, and animals becoming extinct. The trends of global warming have been measured using all types of measurements, like um, aircraft, satellites, ships, etc. And what all these measurements are telling us is that at Earth is warming 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like 0 0.85 degrees Celsius, warmer than it was in 1880. Now, the big problem is that we as a world and we as a community signed the Paris Agreement which says that our world cannot get any warmer than 2 degrees Celsius than it was in 1880. Yet here we are, each year getting closer to that limit. So, the effects. Obviously, you guys know that there are a bunch of effects of global warming on our environment, community, society, and on our planet in general. And today I'm going to mainly focus on the sea level increase. So, the sea level has increased over a foot since 1880, and the three sources that contribute to this fact are the fact that um, the there are the hotter oceans in the world and the hotter waters are expanding, which is called the teapot effect, and that small masses of ice all around the world are also melting. And the most commonly known one is that the two biggest ice sheets on this planet, the Greenland and the Arctic, are also melting. So. Sea level rise, some important data that I think you should really think about and really, you should really know, is that um, scientists have recorded and have, um, yeah, collected data over these past years, and this is annual flooding. They have collected data on annual flooding. And so in the year 2000, scientists said that there were two to three days per year where flooding occurred. Now, currently, there's five to seven days where flooding occurred. In 2030, there will be floodings um, 7 to 15 days per year, and in 2050, there will be 25 to 75 days in the 365 days that we have per year. Now, this is just a number, right? And it doesn't seem like much, but if you actually think about it, 75 days out of 365 days that we have is a lot. By the time one flooding happens, we as a world will not be able to economically rebuild and rescue the area that suffered from this flooding from the previous floods, which means that this land will be potentially lost forever. Now, the need, so this is the point, okay, so the point that I'm going to talk about right now is a point that I think is underestimated, not really talked about in climate change talks, and I don't even think that a lot of people who actually are aware of this problem. And this problem is that we need better and more monitoring. So, relating back to sea level, one cannot simply just go in the shoreline and measure every single inch of the shoreline using various instruments. We nowadays need what's called uh, digital elevation models. So, an example of a point about new and better monitoring is when NASA released this model a couple of years ago called the Satellite-Based Radar um, Topography Mission, which basically estimated that 110 million people that currently live inland will suffer permanently from regular flights. Now, a newer DEM released by Climate Central said and estimated that there will be over 237 million people suffering from, this, um, from these floods. So, What's my point in showing you this example and telling you this example to all of you? Well, this example exactly highlights my point that we need to advance our technology and we need newer technology. Because by having newer technology, that will allow us to have
have um, more accurate data and more data that actually resembles the problems that are going on right now, which helps us prevent um, or predict the future problems and obviously, you know, prevent and try to solve these problems that we're having. So, so, um, like, so in the small insight into the climate central model that we released a couple of months ago. Um, so like any other scientific model, there is the um, low investment and the high investment. So it's like the worst case scenario and the best case scenario. So the low end estimate basically said that um, the emissions, the greenhouse emissions will actually level by 2040 and then they will actually start to decline. And that um, only 900,000 sorry, U.S. citizens will suffer from floodings regularly. Now, 900,000 is a pretty big number, but compared to their high-end estimate, it estimated that over 200 million U.S. citizens will suffer from this flooding. And it also estimated that um, the greenhouse emissions will increase more rapidly, and therefore there will increase more rapidly the meltdown of these icebergs. Now, here you can see an example of the scientific data that has been collected over these past years showing how different areas across the U.S. and across the world potentially will look like if sea levels increase and climate change keeps going at the rate that it's going right now. So here you can see Boston, where we're all currently. So um, Boston will be 37% flooded and its neighbor Cambridge will be 86% flooded. Houston. Houston. I would say is on the lesser affected side with only 5% of it affected, but its neighbor Galveston is 100% affected. Now, this 5% affected of Houston is not that much, but that uh, the space agency that Houston has, the vast industrial zone that also Houston has, and the shipping lanes will all be underwater, which is really problematic for Houston. So Miami, a classic climate change example. Scientists predict that it will be 99% flooded and Miami Beach will be 100% flooded, which means that we will have to have mandatory evacuations for millions of people that are currently living in Miami and we have to put them somewhere else. And then New York City, our neighbor, it will also be similarly flooded to what Boston will be, so 39% flooded, but it just shows how sea level rise is such a big problem. Now, Shifting from sea level rise to more current news, I would like to talk about what's going on currently with California. So California has been going through something called preventive blackouts. So what um, they did was the company of electricity that California has, called PG&E, they went through blackouts because they were afraid that any sparks or any small malfunction would start and spread a humongous wildfire. But the problem is that 1.1 million people actually suffered from this. A million people, houses, and businesses suffered from these preventive blackouts. And now, wildfires are more important. So wildfires like the King Cake Fire, it burned down 70,000 acres. And then the Getty Fire was a little smaller fire with like 700 acres worth as well. And these wildfires and blackouts, they make California go under mass evacuation. So California has to enforce mandatory evacuation for a lot of people. And you might think, well, what's the big deal? You know, we're saving people's lives, we're putting them into less risky areas. Well, the problem is that a lot of these people that are evacuated, they don't want to leave what they know. They don't want to start a brand new page. And I personally know how hard that is. So that's a really big problem. Now, um, going on to more current news, just on Thursday, there were um, wildfires in Los Angeles going on, in the north of Los Angeles. Um, so, with the Maria fire, for example, it burnt down, I checked yesterday night, it was 9,000 acres, with 0% of it contained, which means that we're still not in control of any of the wildfires, so it's still spreading till today. And then there was also a 46 fire, with only around 300 acres burnt, and 15% of it the causes of these wildfires, you might be asking, are not directly related to climate change, but the reason why they spread so quickly and why they were so damaging are, which is what I'm going to get through now. So why do I think this will only get worse? 
It's because um, climate change is drying out California's landscape. It's not just California. It's also places like Madrid, for example, where I'm from. So while climate change is drying out areas, it's also causing extreme rainfall, for example, in others. So um, lower, going back to California, lower relative humidity um, will make brush to um, get drier, and therefore it will um, make even just a small spark cause like a huge wildfire. So, yes. so here on the top you can see how a bunch of wildfires, the top 10 wildfires were recorded, and you can see how the red bars are um, the wildfires that occurred from 2001, and you can see that they make up the majority of this bar, which means that fires will only get more popular. So now, the part that you've been probably waiting for, and it will give you more hope. So I'm going to talk about now things that we can do to tackle climate change. So this is a point that I think is not really even considered. I don't think it's the first thing that pops up in your head when they say, oh, what are we going to do to solve climate change? And that is empower women. Apparently, there have been studies that say that um, gender and climate change are actually really strongly linked. So when communities are shrinking because there are you know, floods happening, droughts, or whatnot, general natural disasters, like you might know, the most vulnerable are the ones who suffer the most, right? And guess who the most vulnerable are? Women. So for some reason, women have, women have a greater risk of dying, getting injured, or whatnot in natural disasters. But it's not just the fact that um, they get injured or die, it's also the fact that they get like they're more likely to get infected. So, um, for example, there have been studies that said that prolonged droughts, they can precipitate women into early marriage. And the problem is not that they marry early. The problem is that when they marry early, that means that the number of fertility years that they have is more. So it means that they are more likely to have more children, so more people on this planet, so more reason for CO2 emissions, etc. And then also other studies say that floods can actually force women into last resort of prostitution, which is um, because they can't make their ends meet. So, so um, I believe that um, we must make gender equality a reality. I can't just be standing here talking to you, or you can't just talk to your friend about this. We have to make a global push about this. And I think that we can empower women by doing three things. And by the way, these um, empowering statements mostly are towards are directed towards less economically developed countries, but they can be applied also to more economically developed countries. So we can empower women professionally. So in my opinion, I believe that women are the primary farmers of the world. You might be asking, what does that mean? So actually, I realized that studies um, show that if women were treated more equally professionally, they were less likely to actually have children because you know they don't have time to take care of them or whatever, and it therefore leads to small families. And then um, they also show that the the land that uh, women farm is actually more effective and more productive than the one of men. So if we empower women, we can make them you know save the planet. <laughs> so. Um, I also think that um, we can empower women by restricting growth or limiting our uh, global population growth. And we can do this by giving women proper or high quality medical reproductive health or just health care in general. And we can do this by making birth control or um, medical health more available to women throughout the world. And we can achieve that by educating them. This comes to my third point. So, 130, over 130 million women across the world are refused or denied access to school. Yeah, it's pretty scary. But yet, studies show that the more educated a woman is, the less likely they are to have big families. And empowering women to have smaller families will be a huge benefit to climate, just because studies show that one, there will be one billion fewer people on this planet who just educate women. It's as simple as that. So, I've been talking a lot about what we should do as a world and as a society, but what we can do individually is also something else. 
So we can, again, you know, as a whole, we can unite for bold climate action because a lot of improvement is still needed. I mean, we're still going towards better ways, but we still need a lot more. But individually, we can use energy wisely. We can switch to more efficient light bulbs. We can search for the energy star levels when we buy new appliances like fridges, microwaves, etc. We can unplug electronics when we're not using them or when we know that they're already at a good percentage and a bunch of other things. So another thing is that we can get charged up with renewables. Yes, this is very common to say in climate change uh, conversations, but a lot of us have already switched to more renewables, but things like costs, etc., are pulling us back. We need to have a global push towards renewables because that would help tremendously. Now, another thing, and this is a fun one, we can eat for a better climate and more stable planet. Actually, the more, so you can eat more meat-free meals and you can buy organic. Yes, it costs a little more, but just think that it's for the better good. You can even grow your own food in the backyard. It doesn't matter. And I'm pretty sure that kids will be very enthusiastic about this. But a major one is that you cannot really waste food. That's just... Can't do that. And then, actually, a fun fact is that you could actually start by eating insects. That will actually save or like make the planet more sustainable because, um, yeah, we're eating less meat free food, but more meat free foods. And actually, if you think this is gross or you don't want to try it, I tried it just for the sake of this, and it actually feels like you're eating chips and it actually tastes pretty nice. So, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, uh, start up a climate conversation, Eat, whether it's with your parents in a dinner or like a speech like I'm doing right now. We just need more global awareness. We need people to know what climate change and global warming is doing to our planet. And then lastly, we can, you can green your individual community. A lot of people probably take public transit, but you can also ride a bike or if it's a little, not, if it's not really feasible, you can advocate bike lanes in your community. Can car share. Uber Pool has made this tiny step forward by implementing Uber Pool, but we can still push for more. And then you can switch to an electric car. I mean, yes, Teslas are really expensive, but I hate to break it to you, there are cheaper alternatives nowadays, so you can go buy one of those. And then the last one is a little tricky, but um, it is to fly less. I understand that if you have to like, see your family or you know, business trips, you have to take the airplane. But if it's just for pleasure or leisure's sake, just realize, like, rethink that and realize that it's better if you don't. Now, um, this last point is basically, so you, have, you don't have to, but you should support youth led or just in general climate movements. For example, um, Britta Thunberg, shown in this image here, she started literally by sitting on the street was pouring down with a sign next to her saying, we have to change our rules, we have to change, we have to push for more climate action in Stockholm. And guess what? It turned out to be a global movement. Now everybody's pushing towards this, especially the youth. And so I'd like to leave you guys with just a small food for thought. We are 7 billion people on this planet with just one common challenge, in my opinion, one major challenge, which is global warming. Um, for those of you who think that, oh, it's too late, I'm not going to try because, you know, the effects are already so bad, you know, there's no turning back, that's where you go wrong. Small changes are what matters because small changes in a big planet with, filled, of, filled with a lot of people are what makes a large change. Like David Suzuki once said, in a world where there are 7 billion people, each of us are just a droplet in a bucket, but with drops, we can fill any bucket. And with that, I thank you for your time.